policy interface organized by the Biodiverse Atlas Partnership under the lead of the French Ministry of Environment. So interrelations between science and policy for biodiversity uh, governance have been gaining increasingly attention, uh, especially at the international level. And in that context, we will discuss today about the Convention on Bi Biological Diversity, the so-called CBD, and its uh, structure, purpose, and processes. And we will highlight the ways scientists, so you as participants, can fit in the CBD policy making mechanisms. So we thank you very much for joining us today as participants or as speakers. And I, yeah, the floor is yours, Chloe, for the facilitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So I will start to briefly remind you of the program of today's uh, webinar. So for the welcome words, we will hear several presentations from CBD experts and also from st staff members of the Secretariat of the CBD to provide you um, a large overview of the convention, but also its structure processes. And so then we will briefly outline the links between the CBD and the European Partnership Biodiversa Plus before splitting you into two breakout groups, respectively to your uh, Biodiversa Plus funding call. So that's either Biodiv Health or Biodiv Protect for today's workshop. So within each group, you will have the opportunity to know more about the CBD agenda in respect to your research thematic. So that's thanks to, that will be thanks to the presentations of some um, staff members of the Secretariat of the CBD. And so after that, we will all come back together in the main room for an insightful presentation on the ways to get involved in the CBD processes as a scientist. And this will be followed by a testimonial from Professor Raymond's experience in the science policy in, uh, intern phase. And so as you can see on the program here, um, along the whole workshop, there will be several Q&A sessions to allow you to interact with the speakers and ask your questions. But before starting, um, and just so everyone knows, we are recording this session and it will be broadcast on Biodiversa Plus YouTube channel. So if you have any problem with that, please contact us uh, either on the Zoom chat or either by email. And another important info is that in order to facilitate the session and also avoid the background noises, we would kindly ask you to please ensure you are muted if you are not, if you are not speaking. But then for the Q&A sessions, Please do not hesitate to use the hand raise function on Zoom or either um, interact with the chat. Both are, are available. And if you have any question, please refer to someone from the Biodiversa Plus team. You can recognize us with the Biodiversa Plus background, so please do not hesitate. And if there are no any questions, we can start um, with the welcome words. And so I will um, invite, um, give the floor to Rob Hendricks from the Dutch Ministry of the Environment and Climate Policy, um, who is also involved in the CBD as a national focal point, focal point sorry, for the Netherlands. So he will briefly present us Biodiversa Plus and also um, the work of Biodiversa Plus to disseminate science in the policy realm and especially um, in international fora. So please, Rob, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Chloe. And uh, thanks for this opportunity uh, to uh, uh, speak uh, on behalf also of uh, my colleague uh, uh, Rainer Zotke from Germany and Rainer and myself are involved in Biodiversa Plus as uh, co-leads. So we are co-leading all the uh, uh, activities in the work package on internationalization. So that is all the activities aiming um, of the Biodiversa Plus related work beyond the borders of Europe. And it is in that context that I would like to welcome you uh, all very much and uh, to also speak a little bit uh, uh, towards this question, why is dissemination in the policy realm a key aspect of Biodiversa Plus? And I will also in a minute go a little bit into the um, uh, aspect of uh, 
the, the uh, transnational added value of PDVSA uh, plus uh, funded projects. But first, let me stress that in this phase of Biodiversa Plus, um, the, um, uh, the international perspective has even grown compared to earlier phases. Our membership by now uh, reaches uh, quite significantly beyond the borders of, uh, uh, of Europe. And also the activities and the focus in the call uh, calls and all all the funded project is uh, much uh, beyond uh, the rel the relevance of a single uh, country and also beyond the um, European borders. Next slide, please. So uh, compared to uh, earlier phases of uh, Biodiversa, uh, the um, uh, the focus has even more moved towards uh, the re being relevant at the science policy interface. So to have the uh, the knowledge developed, also feeding into uh, the policy realm. And today we are focusing on the international aspect of that. So uh, specifically the CBD, but also the activities. Uh, um, of Biodiversa Plus uh, in the, uh, towards the internationalization of European research and infrastructure uh, and, uh, and innovation are um, aiming, um, for example, uh, on interactions with uh, global research infrastructures and um, aiming at uh, feeding into uh, IPBES as well. But as said, today we are focusing on uh, the CBD. And um, next slide. Uh, my final uh, opening remarks refer to the transnational added value of funded research uh, projects. Um, and this slide provides uh, us with uh, some uh, initial figures uh, illustrating the fact that um, uh, working with uh, transnational teams of, uh, of uh, research partners is, um, is um, providing specific uh, results and uh, the, uh, the dark blue figures here are indicating the um, participation of partners beyond the borders of Europe and also uh, within the ongoing projects there's quite a lot of study sites beyond the borders of Europe. And that obviously is a very good uh, indication of uh, the relevance of the, uh, the, the, all the results that are being produced by, by you in the audience today uh, for um, also um, feeding into policy making in uh, relationship to the CBD. So that's uh, where I will be ending uh, today. Thank you all for being here and um, looking forward to, to this uh, discussions and uh, back to you, Chloe. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, so to continue with the welcome words, I would like now to thank Sakile Sicilina, who is head of the Biodiversity Science Policy and Governance Unit at the Secretariat of the CBD. So I will thank you to, for joining us today and I will invite her to take the floor for a presentation on why science and knowledge are key to the CBD work. Uh, thank you, Chloe, and uh, thank you to the Biodiversa Plus team for inviting um, not just me, but my colleagues to uh, address this webinar. Um, my name is Sakile and I, um, I lead the work of the Secretariat on areas relating to uh, science um, and specifically uh, relating to um, uh, specific biomes such as forests and um, dry and subhumid lands, mountains, um, but also on areas of work that are cross-cutting across those biomes such as 
invasive alien species, biodiversity and health, protected areas, uh, climate change. Um, so today I just want to talk about how um, the CBD uses science uh, to inform policy. So um, as you will know, or maybe you will still hear today, uh, the CBD has um, over the years adopted um, progressive targets um, for the conservation of biological diversity, for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. Um, there was the 2010 target um, and associated uh, sub-targets. Um, and then there was the 2011-2020 uh, strategy for uh, strategic plan for biodiversity. And as of uh, December 2022, um, the CBD parties have adopted the global biodiversity, the Kunming Montreal global, Biodiver uh, global biodiversity framework. Those um, frameworks, they contain global targets, um, which the, the targets are based on um, the best available science. And so how that happens is there are two processes, two main processes that are used to inform the development of those uh, global targets. Um, so under the CBD itself, uh, the, the, the CBD um, publishes every few years, the Global Biodiversity Outlook. And the Global Biodiversity Outlook looks at um, the status and trends um, in biodiversity. Um, and it also looks at progress by CBD parties in uh, implementing the objectives of the convention and also in reaching those targets that have been agreed. And it uses a variety of sources. Um, and then, um, yes, I'm sorry, I don't have any slides. I'm just making my presentation orally without any slides. Um, yeah. Um, in 2011, since 2011, since the establishment of the uh, intergovernmental um, platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, the IPES, um, the successive reports of the IPES, the different regional and global um, assessments are integrated to are assessed by the the CBD's subsidiary body on scientific technical and technological advice the SUBSTA um, reviews the outputs of the IPES um, and then these outputs are integrated uh, in in recommendations uh, for action um, by the CBD uh, conference of parties um, and then um, these recommendations eventually are used uh, by parties when they uh, negotiate uh, international, uh, the, the global targets. Um, as well at national level. So when, when the CBD ad adopts the global targets, um, it encourages uh, it or requires countries to develop national targets based on the international targets and the global targets. And the countries are expected to develop um, national targets uh, that are based on the best available science in order to inform the national targets and then the national policy actions that are in integrated to to execute, to implement um, and to achieve the national targets and the global targets. Um, I just realized that maybe all, a, a lot of you are not aware of the CBD and all the acronyms that I'm using. So I'll just take a step back. <laughs> um, so the CBD is an international treaty. Uh, it's, it was adopted in 1992, and it has three objectives, the conservation of biological diversity, sustainable use of biological diversity, and the fair and equitable sharing um, of uh, the benefits arising from biodiversity, uh, genetic resources. Um, the governance of the convention is undertaken by the conference of the parties. So each member state, each country that signs, uh, that signs onto the convention 
becomes a member state, it becomes a party. And every two years, the parties, all the countries meet in what is called the Conference of the Parties. And that's where most of the policy uh, decisions for the convention are taken. So all the decisions relating to forest biodiversity or climate change or capacity building are taken by the Conference of the Parties. The Conference of the Parties has two, two main subsidiary bodies. There are more, um, but in, for the purposes of today's discussion, I'll talk about the subsidiary body on scientific, technical and technological advice, um, which was established, as you can imagine, to provide scientific and technical advice to the Conference of Parties, to enable the Conference of Parties to translate science into policy decisions. So the substa is meant to look at the science, what's the latest in the science, what are the implications for this, for the uh, objectives of the convention, for meeting the targets of the convention. There is also, in addition, the subsidiary body on implementation, which, as you can imagine from its name, is looking at the actual implementation of the convention, what is going on at national level, how far are we in actually implementing the provisions of the convention at national level. I mentioned that there are others, um, such as the working group on HA and HA is about um, uh, okay. knowledge and indigenous peoples and local communities. So basically that is the structure of the CBD. The Global Biodiversity Outlook, which I said was produced by the CBD, goes through the process of the SUBSTA, the science, Subsidiary Body on Science, and its recommendations are reviewed by the COP and the COP takes decisions. Um, and then an external body, which is IPBES, also provides science inputs into the work, and that goes again to the subsidiary body, to the COP, the COP takes the decisions, and then countries are expected to implement those decisions. So. I hope that was useful. Yes, thank you very much, Sakile, for your insightful introduction to the CBD and the, your presentation on the use of science by the CBD. Um, that was very insightful. And I think we can, that's a good transition because we are very lucky also to have um, Professor Dr. Sieben um from the University of Oldenburg in Germany to provide us um, a further introduction to the CBD and its science policy interface. So he is a researcher in ecological economics and he's one of the greatest experts in the CBD governance and inter international biodiversity policy. And so I will now hand it over to him and I think he will further present him himself too. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure for being there. I'm certainly not the greatest expert. <laughs> I'm just a small light in the in the sky. Um, yeah, and um, also thank you to Sakile uh, to uh, uh, lay out some of the uh, key points already. Uh, uh, of course, that uh, takes a bit of uh, my uh, talk uh, that uh, might make my life easier to squeeze everything into the short uh, time given. But um, and and we might also reserve some time for the uh, for the discussion and questions. I think that's that's important because uh, of course I'm running a big risk here uh, uh, to uh, tell you what you already know. But um, since uh, Charlotte and Chloe advised me to do that and maybe to give you a bit of a background more from the social science perspective or from the governance perspective. Um, I thought maybe there is something interesting and new for some of you uh, uh, in this in this talk, and uh, if not, uh, I would <laughs> beg beg your pardon <laughs> in advance. Okay, and um, maybe just briefly uh, regarding my my work uh, uh, relating to the to the CBD, um, it uh, uh, was a study that we conducted on the functioning of international organizations and the secretariat that is mentioned here, but that is uh, um, the employer um, of Sakile. Um, but uh, we also compared that to other secretariats and other uh, organizations.
organizations like uh, the uh, UN Environment Programme and even the World Bank uh, regarding their, their various activities. And one particular focus of that study was the, the knowledge production and which role do even these international organizations have regarding uh, research or regarding gathering, supporting research and uh, also uh, uh, building on and, and depending on, uh, on uh, academic and scientific knowledge. Uh, and uh, so my, and my particular task was to look into the CBD. And so I visited the, the secretariat and talked to many people in that uh, in that regard. So that's also a bit the basis of what I'm, I'm, I'm talking here. But bear in mind, it is uh, a social science perspective. It's not a natural science perspective or so, but um, uh, I try to understand a bit the, 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 under, the role of knowledge in these decision making. OK, next slide, please. Next yeah, so uh, this is just the overview uh, for uh, four main questions I'd like to address. What's special about the uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity and uh, the uh, this is the high risk to always uh, turn to these acronyms CBD um, uh, that um, might also I might also fall, fall into this trap. Um, that's that's the first part. The second I would briefly now I could be really brief uh, give an overview of the main bodies uh, of the convention and uh, the decision making in those. And then the main focus is on the uh, science and, and policy making in this uh, context of uh, of the international convention um, uh, of the CBT and some some ideas some outlook um, from my side. But that's the whole topic of also the later discussion. Next slide, please. So the convention, as you see, this is the UN uh, headquarters in uh, New York, uh, is a convention. Next slide, please. A convention that is set uh, at the international level. It's not the European. It's not a, a regional or only a national uh, uh, agreement or law. But it's international law and it's global. That's important. A global um, agreement. Um, but it uh, is not the first of its kind. So there are quite a number uh, of predecessors or other treaties, international treaties that uh, uh, address related issues of uh, conservation of certain parts, uh, certain biomes or um, uh, certain uh, certain species. The Ramsar Convention on Wetlands was already signed uh, in the uh, 70s, early 70s. CITES, important one on uh, trade. Uh, so whenever you would like to uh, export uh, the tooth of uh, a lion from Africa or wherever, I'm currently in South Africa, uh, don't do that. Uh, the CITES uh, um, uh, uh, <coughs> says that's that's uh, that's for, uh, forbidden. Then there's a convention on migratory species um, that, of course, require particular uh, attention because of their migration, and then they cross also legal borders. That's uh, that what, even though um, animals don't have to uh, apply for visas, but they just they just travel, and then they fall under other. Uh, protection uh, schemes in other countries. And so there was international uh, agreement needed here. Um, and uh, there's the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture under the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization a bit later. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> then, then the actual adoption of the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity. And uh, the main one, uh, the first main characteristic I would like to point out is that it's a global. Um, a convention that was signed uh, at Rio at the very first Rio summit in 92. That's why it's also called one of the Rio conventions. And it also breathes the spirit of Rio. Namely, uh, in the early 90s, many of the countries uh, uh, thought uh, with the end of the Cold War, the world could really address its resources now to the real pressing problems of environment and uh, social development. Um, and that's uh, the underlying uh, idea of this, uh, uh, of many of the of the conventions. And uh, it was also uh, in, adopted in parallel to the uh, Convention on uh, Climate Change that you probably know, the Framework Convention, and the Convention to Combat Desertification. Next slide, please. 
The Convention uh, on Biolog Biological Diversity is an internationally binding treaty. So it's it's international law, piece of international law. It is uh, signed uh, and ratified by 196 parties. Um, you see uh, the, the map and you see the important non-member. That's uh, maybe the other important thing to, to recognize. Um, <clears throat> somewhat sadly enough, the United States is not member of the, uh, is not a party to the Convention on Biological Diversity still. Um, and uh, it, it entered into force just a year after its signature in, um, uh, in Rio. And yeah, maybe next slide. The uh, convention has a particular approach, uh, Sakili already um, uh, related to that. It uh, coined and developed an important definition or guiding definition for biological diversity. We call now uh, biodiversity. Of course, the world was around uh, already um, earlier, but um, uh, this legal capturing of that, that notion uh, was, was important. Uh, and it includes the uh, uh, all ecosystems, and that's important, the diversity of species, between species and ecosystems, and maybe next slide. And uh, that uh, captures or includes genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystems diversity. And these are three levels of diversity, which um, go beyond maybe in everyday knowledge or understanding of biodiversity, which focus mainly on species, but, but the genetic and the ecosystems are also very, very important elements and pillars of the, of the notion of biodiversity in the, according to the, to the CPD. Next slide. Oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to reopen now. Okay. I don't know. We had a, an issue with the point point that just got off, but uh, okay, I have it now. I'm gonna reshare it again. Yeah. Really so the, the three. Sorry for this. No problem. <laughs> I'm going to the next thing that Zakiria already mentioned. The three main objectives of the um, convention that are set out in Article One of the convention. That is the conservation of biological diversity. Um, <clears throat> then, and that's also important, the sustainable use. So it's not only conservation, but uh, use um, of its components. And uh, that then also became the, the uh, guiding sentence for uh, the Nagoya Protocol, the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising of the utilization of genetic resources. So um, we'll come to, to an example um, later on. But what's important here is that due to its nature as a treaty between nations, between national governments, uh, and of course the, uh, uh, the legal bodies behind, like the parliaments that agree to it, uh, it is. It gives the right to use to states, yeah, and uh, that's uh, the, the basic principle. States have the sovereign right to exploit their own resources. Of course, there there are limits to that. They can they have to uh, <clears throat> ensure uh, conservation and uh, and sustainable use, but um, it is states that uh, are the main actors and that are kind of the owners. So the the ownership question here is clarified by by the convention um, in in that uh, in that uh, sentence here. Um, as I put it down. Next slide. And the important um, element, or one important other element that I wanted to uh, point out, and that also became an important discussion, also uh, uh, looked at from other uh, convention processes, is uh, the uh, ruling of Article 8J. That's what Sakila already mentioned. That's the article that looks into indigenous communities and their knowledge and their particular, particular roles and um, their rights. Uh, so <clears throat> the, um, the convention tries at least to uh, include them uh, more and better than I would say uh, so far the, the climate, uh, climate change, the, in the climate change, we don't, we don't have that, that in that uh, explicit manner, but that's an important, uh, important uh, factor of the, of the convention on biological diversity. 
This is not a chief. This is a good colleague of mine, Pais Yanda, in this picture. But I thought he looks like a chief here. OK, next slide, please. And uh, the convention, when it was signed, um, um, building also on the connection to many of the other conventions that I mentioned, uh, drew very much on the framework concept that might be known to most of you is the ecosystem service idea. Um, here it's uh, the version that's picked up and developed further uh, by the Millennium Ecosystem Assistant 2005, um, connecting it to human well-being factors. Um, and uh, this is also the underlying notion that human well-being depends so much on, on the ecosystems. And that's what we also read out of this idea of sustainable use, yeah? um, that uh, uh, the genetic diversity can be used, but it must uh, be conserved as such. Uh, um, so it doesn't mean conservation without humans or keeping humans out, but, uh, but to uh, also look for uh, human needs and human well-being. And the, the foundation of that in nature and nature's contribu contribution. And now next slide. That was the, the first important contribution, I would say, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service. That was already mentioned, IPBES, that developed the uh, another framework that builds very much on the ecosystem services framework, but uh, tries to give more uh, focus on the cultural and the own value, in the, the intrinsic value of nature, um, than just to see nature as a service to, to humans. Um, but of course, many of the elements of the ecosystem service approach are included into that in that that approach um, and the approach is now known as nature's contribution to people ncp at times next slide please to um, the the, uh, the <coughs> convention on uh, biological diversity is a framework convention. Of course, there are uh, elements to, uh, uh, that are decided directly in there, but there are two main uh, uh, protocols that uh, are under this umbrella. That's the Cartagena Protocol on biosafety, dealing with uh, all issues of genetically modified organisms or living modified organisms and their trade between between states that's all was already signed in the early 2000s and 2000, uh, 2000 and entered into fourth 2000 into force 2003 next slide please and the second one is nagoya protocol and that is the one on um, access and benefit sharing or access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits yeah, in short access and benefit sharing agreement that uh, relates to questions of um, the use of uh, traditional uh, medicines or genetic resources. Here we have an, uh, a cactus plant from Southern Africa uh, <clears throat> that uh, reduces appetite, and that was uh, used then by Pfizer, big company, as a uh, as a diet uh, drug or was developed into that and um, uh, and based on the uh, regulations of the Nagoya protocol they had to sign agreements with the uh, Khoisan people that uh, uh, knew and used that that plant for for purposes of reducing their, their appetite when they're on their long ways and um, uh, <clears throat> and there there was a compensation uh, agreed by um, uh, that builds on this uh, on this law um, and uh, on this on this protocol and the idea here is exactly to have this this benefit sharing that the benefit out of these resources and the 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 knowledge about that should also benefit uh, those communities from which it comes so that uh, the big ones like Pfizer do not have an incentive to exploit um, the the knowledge of uh, the Khoisan in this case. Next slide, please. Then uh, Sakila already mentioned the targets. That's how the um, convention, the main uh, convention works as we know it also from other fields uh, uh, like from the sustainable development goals that have been uh, agreed in 2015, um, <clears throat> the same year as the important Paris Agreement was, was signed. Uh, uh, and uh, that also has this important goal uh, in the climate field. We all know that about the two degrees or uh, <clears throat> ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius maximum uh, um, average temperature increase uh, on the global level. Um, uh, the CBD always try to um, 
have something similar. Yeah, that's why um, I uh, at least pick one of the uh, specific targets here, target five, uh, that uh, is by 2020. So there's a target here. The rate of loss of all natural habitats, including forests, is at least halved and where possible brought zero, close to zero, and degradation and fragmentation uh, is significantly reduced. So there is the attempt to uh, quantify that also um, to uh, uh, <clears throat> make this conservation element uh, uh, also, uh, in a sense, uh, monitorable or accessible. And uh, uh, this was a formulation from the, from the so-called IG targets in 2011-2020. Many of them have not been achieved, um, and that has various reasons. One is certainly, um, Zakile also mentioned that, uh, that it's uh, rather difficult to have uh, <clears throat> an indicator. So there's no agreed upon indicator as we have it, for instance, in the economics for GDP or in uh, climate change, we have the, the uh, temperature increase or the, the uh, parts per million of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. This is not the case, at least not at that level, at that uh, aggregated level for, for the Convention on Biological Diversity. Next slide. So, and then uh, following the, um, the expiration of in 2020, the, the IG targets expired, and then uh, negotiations were already ongoing to have a new uh, set of targets. Um, and that then uh, came to a close or were uh, set uh, and put together in the in the Kunmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and that was agreed 2022 um, in in Montreal it was supposed to be held in Kunmin, but uh, that, uh, that then was was done by the secretary in, in Montreal, and that sets out uh, also clear goals um, and <clears throat> um, the target area is 2030 and then further until 2050 that and tries also to to quantify that uh, relatively clearly uh, that uh, uh, for instance, uh, there the, the should be an improvement in the in the ecosystems. And what became quite important in the follow-up discussions is the thirty percent goal of thirty percent of the of the terrestrial and of the marine spaces should be protected uh, under under protection laws. Next slide. Now, what uh, is the other main bodies? We could be very brief here. Um, you see the slides: COP and MOP. Um, that have already been introduced. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the main um, decision making is the conference of the parties every two years, agreeing like the one in in Kunming uh, uh, in 2022. Uh, they make the main decisions, and uh, if you take all decisions together, uh, and that is a huge, huge, thick volume that uh, 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 <clears throat> is is already um, together. Everything is well documented on the web page, so the web page of the uh, convention is is well maintained, and um, you might find every every detail if you search a bit. Then um, the um, uh, operations of the convention um, um, uh, um, yeah, mainly done uh, on a more regular basis by the SABSTA, the subsidiary body on scientific technological and technological advice, which is the preparatory body to prepare the decisions at the conference of the parties. Um, and uh, we also looked at one with uh, some colleagues in, in the Substar, which is more intended to be experts uh, that uh, gather all the scientific knowledge and pr prepare then a, a text. But it is became more and more over the years political. Maybe Sakile could comment on that. Um, so it's more and more political decision makers or minist ministry officials that are now negotiating in the uh, in the Substar. Um, because because uh, that's the main preparatory uh, mechanism for the conference of the parties. And maybe one important uh, aspect is that conf the conference of the party is like all UN uh, conferences uh, or uh, uh, treaties works on the um, one country, one vote uh, principle, um, as the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change as well. And uh, in that sense, uh, and the uh, goal is to have all agreements in by consensus. All members have to agree. That makes it very difficult at times. And, and that makes it also quite slow and lengthy. But that's also the strength of this thing that all 
um, members at least or the parties are, are part of that. Okay, next slide, please. Then there are more convention bodies. Uh, Sakili also alluded to that uh, on implementation. There is an open end, uh, working group on the protected areas and develop toolkits, which is quite interesting now in, to see it in the marine area, Rian, and uh, on Article uh, 8J on the traditional knowledge and lo local knowledge. Next slide, please. Then there's the Secretariat. Quite importantly, it is not a secretariat like um, the former function of a typewriter or so, but it is a bureaucracy uh, that uh, underlies and prepares in particular uh, all the decision making of the convention. It's located in Montreal at the moment. Um, Sakili might might give have better better information. I took from a website 110 staff members, and the main function is to prepare the um, uh, all the meetings, decision making, but also um, uh, to prepare it, uh, in the sense of preparing texts, which is quite uh, in our comparative uh, analysis uh, quite a bit more than another. <clears throat> excuse me, other secretaries are allowed to do. And they also have the important uh, task of communicating about biodiversity and collecting the knowledge that is relevant for decision making. Next slide, please. So in this study that we did, we, we found the secretariat in, um, in comparison to others as what we call a lean shark. So it's quite, quite lean, so relatively small. So for instance, uh, the UN uh, <coughs> Environment Program has 900 up to 1,000 uh, staff members, and um, uh, so that's, that's relatively small with this 110 uh, staff members. And um, but it's quite quite effective because it uh, it prepares the decisions and uh, uh, and has quite a good reputation with with member states. So it's not very politicized in the sense uh, that uh, that uh, every country has a very very close look on what they're doing as in particular with the climate secretary that was the case um and <clears throat> there is a broad representation of world the world regions uh, so if you look at the uh, at the executive directors um there is also um, most world regions have been represented at some some point in time yeah and this book is just where we uh, documented all these findings next slide please So now, science policy. Next slide. The science policy interface um, is, is very interesting because it's quite evolving and quite, uh, quite dynamic. It has been um, focusing on certain products like the Global Biodiversity Out Outlook. Um, or uh, the TEEP initiative, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity that try to calculate some values of ecosystem services and ecosystem. Um, and uh, and there is also a, a internationally coordinated global taxonomy initiative to uh, uh, get further knowledge about which species are there, because there's this big unknown, how many species are there? Uh, and uh, if we don't know the number, then we really can't assess the, the, the decline or the loss, loss of species. But uh, nowadays, much of the work is being done by the already mentioned IPBES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, that has a work program that you can see here, and that uh, also produce a number of studies, including the, um, the one on the framework, uh, the uh, contribution, Nature's Contributions uh, Framework, now on values and, and a number of other questions. And that is, that's important to note, in independent, independent of the convention process. The convention is, is held under the UN Environment Program, but the IPBES is an independent uh, uh, body like the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, that uh, <clears throat> has a number of states uh, included uh, in the in the decision making uh, and uh, and uh, the 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 bureau and the the um the scientists uh, inside so um we might talk a bit later about about the ipes and uh, the contributions i guess many of you are um, in, informed about that or are already contrib uh, contributing and the strength of the thing is that um, more and more scientists work towards it or contribute to it and through more science scientists contributing, the stronger the, the output. Next, next slide. So 
current research needs. Now it gets a bit more to maybe your work. Um, there are, uh, there is, um, and thank you for, uh, to Chloe and, and Charlotte to uh, pointing that out to me. I, I didn't know that the, the German Institute for uh, um, Biodiversity uh, went through all the, the decisions um, uh, over the years of, of the Convention of the Parties and found out that 314 of those um, include, um, include uh, decision needs or knowledge needs uh, for, uh, for the convention. And, um, and there are various, various kinds of, of questions that the uh, convention process poses to the um, scientific community or communities. Um, like the need for indicators, the need for policy support tools, uh, the need for a solution, uh, uh, like, like toolkits for uh, protected areas. And, and nowadays, just this week, I have to mention this, there was the uh, new agreement on um, marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, BBNJ, um, that was uh, agreed in uh, uh, on, on the 19th this week. So that also includes a huge knowledge uh, request if you want to the scientific community because um, I might might say that um, there's even less known about marine biodiversity than about terrestrial biodiversity even though some even claim that marine biodiversity is bigger than the terrestrial but I don't um, <clears throat> want to interfere in, with uh, 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 with that discussion so and uh, there is is an upcoming need of of that uh, uh, that that realm of marine biodiversity which uh, uh, some st states already address next slide yeah so um by way of outlooking um what are uh, maybe persistent and what are new challenges <clears throat> i already mentioned the the ocean and uh, marine biodiversity as such um, uh, there is still this question of numerical measures. The idea is that we find something and uh, we could uh, develop an agreed upon index or at least a number of species um, or species uh, laws. Uh, there is climate change, which complicates the matter even more. Of course, that's a big driver for species loss, as we all know, but how to quantify it, how to prove that. <clears throat> Colleagues just published a paper uh, in Nature, uh, Evolution and Environment um, on uh, that there is will not, not be such a thing as the 1.5 degree target uh, or goal as uh, in, for biodiversity, um, because um, biodiversity is something that changes all the time and it's very difficult to develop a baseline uh, under under changing framework conditions um <clears throat> yeah and there is disagreement about um dna sequencing and um uh, the digi digi uh, uh, a database on that digital sequence information system and yeah, the implementation of the global biodiversity framework will require, as Sakila also uh, just mentioned, uh, a big uh, research question about uh, a monitoring question. Um, uh, how are these goals achieved? How many marine protected areas and how much uh, of the uh, <clears throat> world's um, terrestrial and marine areas are, are covered by, by protected areas and so on. And now the, the um, area beyond national jurisdiction, which make matters even more difficult because <laughs> lawyers are out, more or less. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> the, the seas are not uh, under any national jurisdiction or regulation. Next and final slide, that's my thanks slide. Yeah, thank you very much and I'm open to any questions and happy to, to answer that as far as I can. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Zittenperner, for this insightful and complete presentation that was a large overview um, to the International Governance of Biodiversity, the Convention on Biolo Biological Diversity, and also to the science uh, policy interface and their um, research needs and knowledge needs. Um, so now we have a few minutes for questions. So this is the opportunity for all of you to um, raise your question. You can type them, type them directly um, in the chat or use the hand raise function on Zoom. 
And yes, so this is the opportunity for you to ask maybe your questions about what have been mentioned during the first presentations or maybe beyond. So please, if you have some, don't hesitate to, to type them in the chat or to raise your hand. I don't see any hand raised for now. Ah, yes, Leonardo, I can give you the floor now. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, quite interesting talk. I have a question regarding uh, the goals for the conservation of biodiversity in terms of uh, the conservation of species that are highly endangered in their native uh, areas, in their native habitats, while being quite dominant in in the new ranges they are occupying. So they can be seen as invasive species or simply exotic species, sometimes naturalized species. And we have this, I don't know, uh, challenge because in, in their new ranges, we need to deal with the impacts they might may cause. And also sometimes they are threatening local biodiversity while they are highly endangered in their native ranges. So. Does the CBD uh, approach take into consideration that maybe we need to change the focus of conservation to try to understand more the impacts of those species in the new ranges and work for the conservation of those species in those, those areas they are occurring? Good question. I might pass this on to, <clears throat> to others because I'm not an expert on that thing. I, I understand that uh, rewilding, um, at least uh, trying to also introduce uh, animals in, in, in the wild again or in other areas uh, that might be uh, suitable for them, is also a strategy in the on the, the global biodiversity uh, framework. But <clears throat> yeah, that interesting question, of course, raises um, uh, touches upon conflict with the existing ones and uh, um, and just one comment on the idea of protected areas, which is also kind of old fashioned regarding the change in, you all know that, in, in the ecosystems, uh, at least through climate change. Uh, so we, we would need somehow to have moving uh, systems if the ecosystems move, and that might be easier in the, in the, uh, in the sea, but even on land we have migrating species and we have uh, also newly migrating species due to climate change would then might require if we want to protect one particular species uh, that also the protection scheme like the the protected area moves but that is of course <laughs> often not not too easy to do thank you for your response Bern. i hope leonardo that did uh, help you um does one any one of you else have a question? Yes, Ivan, please. Right. Thanks for this talk. Um, I had a question about the three levels of diversity that you uh, presented uh, at the start of your talk, because the distinction kind of vanished afterwards. And, and more generally, uh, I've got the feeling that the first level of diversity, genetic diversity level, is somewhat receiving uh, less attention. And uh, what's your view on that, please? Thanks. Yeah, um, I would I would agree. So the main the main paradigm is species diversity, and that's what most people have in mind, and what most of the governance processes focus on, and like the protection scheme also focus on that. But the genetic diversity. <clears throat> I came into discussion uh, around these uh, these initiatives of the um, uh, the databases uh, to have maybe uh, uh, databases of uh, just the gene pool, and then um, yeah, <clears throat> we might not need to have the the ecosystems and the species in situ in in the environment uh, any longer to to conserve them, and um, <clears throat> and it's clear that only. Uh, Genetic diversity within one species uh, ensures also the the long term existence of that of that species at least, and uh, 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 so so this this uh, this approach just to focus on on artificial uh, gene banks is uh, uh, yeah has been criticized a lot and it's only a few 
uh, uh, <coughs> few companies do that or uh, states, but it's not it's not an approach that has been taken by the by the international convention and community. Yeah, because it seems that most of the effort is on, uh, you know, species that uh, are, are used as crops or for animals that we have decided to eat. Uh, but uh, for natural species, if, if this term has a sense, uh, I don't see much being done really in comparison. Yeah, and and within species we have high priority. So, <laughs> and that's uh, like like these anchor species that um, like lions or whatever they they are protected and they are in everybody's mind. But uh, the spiders or the uh, the microbes uh, in the ground that are not even discovered or uh, not even liked by many <laughs> um, <clears throat> that uh, that uh, are part of biodiversity, the species diversity, um, they they are normally not protected or don't, not, not forgotten. But um, they're in this web approach, and that's I think why why this ecosystem approach is so important. That, that the whole ecosystem depends on each other, and that's 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 an important idea that uh, is captured here, and that I think is essential to always communicate uh, uh, with this dominant focus on on anchor species on on these nice nice picture species. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, to keep the timing, we will need to move on to close this uh, Q&A session. But please, if you have additional questions, you can type them in the chat and we will take the time afterwards to come back to it or exchange on your questions afterwards. So please do so. And so I will now hand it over to Charlotte Ledelieu, who coordinates the relations with the CBD and other multilateral environmental agreements at Biodiversa Plus, as she will tell us more on the previous and current links with the CBD and Biodiversa Plus. So please, Charlotte, you now have the floor. Yeah, many thanks, Chloe, and many thanks to the participants so far. So I will briefly present you past and current links between the CBD Convention and Biodiversa Plus and its two previous entities, Biodiversa 2 and Biodiversa 3. So please, next slide, Chloe. So basically, the collaboration between the CBD and our European partnership started in 2014, and it was developed by a funded project itself and not by our partnership. So it was more a bottom-up approach. So the Biodiversa 2 Invaluable Project hold a side event at the CBD COP12 to present its research outcomes. You have the program on the left. And another Biodiversa 2 funded project called FFI uh, also co-drafted an information document uh, supporting the CBD SEPSTA in 2016. So it's, uh, among others, a way to contribute to the work of the convention. In 2018, aspects related to dissemination of research outcomes to international um, decision-making processes were explored by the former European project Eclipse. And in 2018, again, Biodiversa Plus also drafted a guide on policy relevance of research, including at the international level and mentioning the links um, to be made with the Convention on Biological Diversity. So Biodiversa Plus also took, uh, Biodiversa 3, sorry, also took part in the CBD Science Policy Forum in 2018 and presented its work on nature-based solutions. And finally, um, Biodiversa Plus got the recognition of the CBD itself when the co-chairs leading the future global biodiversity framework considered the Biodiversity Conference as a recent accomplishment for the future agreement. Um, so to summarize, Biodiversa 2 and Biodiversa 3 paved the way for our current collaboration with the CBD and its secretariat. So next slide. And finally, I will talk about uh, our current uh, activities with the CBD. So Biodiversa Plus was launched in 2021 and now has a dedicated task about the collaboration with the CBD and other uh, relevant international agreements. It was not the case before, as I mentioned. So today's webinar builds upon three processes, a discussion with our general assembly, uh, gathering all our partners to identify targeted MEAs. For example, uh, we targeted um, our work on the CBD. Uh, on surveys uh, sent to identify specific needs for capacity building, targeting our funded researchers. And finally, uh, a concept note explaining our strategy. 
And uh, finally, two major events took place in 2022 and 2023. A side event at COP15 was organized by Biodiverse Atlas in Montreal, and it was focusing on biodiversity monitoring and a policy forum dedicated to the implementation of the newly adopted Kunming Montreal Bioda Global Biodiversity Framework was organized in April of this year. So we hope this collaboration with the CBD will further develop in the near future, and we hope it will enable uh, research funded under Biodiversity Plus to better disseminate uh, the research outcomes it produces in this uh, key international forum. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte, for this presentation. And so we will move on to the next session. So as mentioned previously, we will now split you into two breakout groups, respectively to your call. So each of the sessions will outline the issues currently at stake in the Convention on Biological Diversity regarding the topics of your either Biodiversa 3 or Biodiversa Plus uh, funded projects. So either um, beauty protect or beauty health, and so two members of um, the secretariat of CBD staff, um, Miss Ejigayehu Seyum Ejigu and Miss Isabel Gonzalez, will provide you key information about its activities and the ongoing processes in which you, as scientists, could disseminate your research outcomes. So, I think, Mariam, you can open the breakout rooms. And also led uh, to the encouragement of countries for a for way forward with a more ambitious target for the post 2020 period. Next slide, please. We all know that protected areas and OECMs are important and creating and maintaining mechanisms for biodiversity conservation is crucial for survival of life on Earth. CBD parties have also long recognized that protected and conserved areas constitute important stock of natural, cultural, and social capital, and that they yield flows of valuable goods, services uh, that benefit humanity and life on earth. So accordingly, the conference of the party to the, to the CBD has also adopted various decisions to encourage the establishment and maintenance of uh, protected areas and uh, other effective conservation, uh, area-based conservation me measures over the years as well. Uh, one of such decision of the COP was the program of work on protected areas, POPA. Next slide, please. Uh, the program of work was adopted in 2004 in Malaysia with the main, main purpose to support the establishment and maintenance of comprehensive, effectively managed, and ecologically representative national and regional systems of protected areas by 2010 for terrestrial and 2012 for marine and coastal areas with the main purpose of reducing the loss of biodiversity and also to contribute to poverty reduction among many other issues of the time. The POPA consisted is first of all the popa is long and covers a number of subjects but it consists of four main interlinked elements the first one is direct actions that need to be taken by parties for planning selecting establishing uh, and strengthening and managing protected area systems and sites uh, it also focused on governance, participation, equity, and benefit sharing, especially on issues related to full participation of IPLCs. It also focused on enabling activities such as uh, adjustment in policy 
institutional and other socioeconomic environment um, for protected areas. Then the Popa required also countries uh, to focus on, on setting minimum standard at least and uh, the use of best practices uh, in their assessments and monitoring for them to be appropriately to be able to appropriately se select the establishment and uh, management of protected areas. Next slide, please. So following the adoption of POPA, the friend of uh, POPA consortium was established as a first attempt to concerted efforts by all. It was an informal collaboration of individuals, NGOs, UN organizations, and government, and with the sole purpose to support the implementation of the POPA. So these friends of POPA contributed to the implementation of the POPA through a number of activities, among which regional training workshops uh, on thematic elements, topics such as ecological gap assessment, business planning, so, um, sustainable finance, effective management, and so on. Uh, also provided capacity building and also uh, has helped develop e-learning curricula. Uh, the POPA also supported countries to set their first POPA uh, action, action plan for the implementation of the POPA. Hence, by 2010 already, the POPA became the most implemented program uh, of the work of the convention. Next slide, please. Okay, this graph, on this graph, we, we see the, the change in coverage over uh, since 1990 to 2010. Uh, there are some dates which are strategically important. 19, we see between 1990 and 91, kind of flat, there was no change. 1991, is the establishment of the JEF. Then 1992, 93, uh, the, uh, the entry into force of the Convention on Biological Di Diversity. Then in 1996, the JEF became the financial mechanism of the CBD. And just all this time, Jeff has been contributing a lot to um, the agenda related to protected areas. 1996, then 2002, the strategic plan, uh, 2010 of the CBD was adopted. 2003, we had the World Park Congress, uh, which took place in Durban, South Africa. And at that Congress, uh, CBD was called to address protected areas as a central theme of its work uh, with the assistance of WCPA. So officially CBD became the legal instrument for protected areas at that time. And the conference of the parties responded to that by adopting uh, the POPA, the program of work in 2004, based mainly on the recommendation from uh, the World Park Congress that took place in Durban, South, South Africa. So we see that the, the gradual important changes that, that have occurred. And by 2010, clearly there was a substantial progress, but the problem was that the Global Biodiversity Outlook 3, the third assessment in 2010, well said, fine, there has been progress, but not enough 
to uh, lower the biodiversity loss or reverse the crisis. Hence, there was a need for a more ambitious target such as uh, the IG biodiversity target 11. Next slide, please. So the strategic plan 2011 uh, uh, 2020, uh, 2020, including IG biodiversity target 11 was adopted uh, by COP10 in Japan in 2010. However, once again, the force assessment of the global biodiversity outlook in 2014, that's two, four years later, indicated there is progress, fine, but there is a need for more focused and systematic efforts to achieve the, uh, the target, target 11 by 2020. At that time, the challenge was a lot of capacity buildings were provided to parties, a lot of efforts were being done to support them, but it was a little bit difficult to keep them engaged and speed up implementation. So the, the Secretariat raised two questions. What do party really need? How can they be assisted? to set their national priority actions <laughs> to enhance effective implementation and achieve the target on time. And then the second question was that, okay, if we help them set their national priority actions, how can the secretariat facilitate effective implementation of the national priority actions? As there was really a need for a clear strategy. Next slide, please. So the strategy was to enhance and accelerate support to parties. So the secretariat, it, to answer to the two questions, came up with a two-phase strategy. The first phase was from 2015 to 2016. That's primarily to develop, to uh, to support parties develop national priority action roadmap to achieve target 11 through uh, a renewing partnerships and commitment with partner organizations, preparing baseline data and information for countries, providing capacity development and securing responses to questionnaires, key answers for the secretariat to help them to help uh, to help them effectively implement and achieve the target and phase 2 was introduced during the period 2017 to 2020 extended to 22 due to covid that was to really speed up inf implementation of national priority actions developed by parties and uh, the secretariat used sub-regional coordination agencies to break down countries into sub-regions and help them support them in a focused manner in small groups rather than trying to achieve all of the 196 parties at the same time and uh, to facilitate also implementation in a concerted but decentralized manner. Everybody has to align and coordinate efforts for effective implementation, but the so implementation itself was the sole responsibility of countries. So it had to be decentralized. Next slide, please. Uh, the first phase, the goal, as I said, is to help countries identify national priority actions as a country driven process, they have to do it themselves. Uh, but the Secretariat supported this by involving key expert partners and, and agencies. Uh, 
seeking their willingness and uh, cooperation, coordination. The Secretariat also developed 196 individual country dos dossiers for target 11 and target 12 on threatened species and shared them with the parties. So they have all their information gathered in one place on each one of uh, the elements of target 11 and target 12. Uh, then the Secretariat kept communicating with POPA and national focal points and organized six regional capacity building workshops. The workshops were important and were unlike other workshops provided in, 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 in the past because the participants worked with the Secretariat for six weeks before the workshop that was to do on some preparatory work. And when they arrived at the workshop, they were already well informed. So the workshop was used, were used as a platform for dialogue between expert partners and national implementers, because both national implementers and expert partners needed information from each other, needed to support and help each, 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 each other. And after the workshop, the participants, the national focal points, country representative were sent home with assignments uh, to with the consultation of expert in their countries, they have to finalize their national priority actions. They have to vet and update their country dossier and answer to uh, questionnaires and then submit the information officially to, uh, to the CBD. This, this was good because once they have set their national priority actions, then CBD can, the secretariat can regularly contact them, remind them and ask them questions about uh, progress on the national priority actions they already set. The next step was reporting to SABSTA and COP, which um, the secretariat did. Next slide, please. The results from the workshop were enormous. 124 countries participated, 100 uh, countries submitted information within the next two months, and over uh, 1,400 priority actions addressing the elements of target 11 was, were determined. And we see that each region um, had set a number of priority actions. Uh, six workshop, we have five in the graph, uh, Asia uh, consists of two regions here. Next slide, please. Then we broke down the, the national priority actions by elements of target, target 11. Um, and the highest number of uh, action that was identified was for effective management. Uh, and they also expressed, uh, they also said uh, priority actions for other effective cons uh, area-based conservation measures as well. So all were covered. So what we realized, analyzing in detail the, the information that was submitted, we realized that if countries manage to implement the national priority actions on time, many elements of target 11 will be achieved by 2020 and lead to multiple benefits to countries. So the next step was to, uh, to go straight to the implementation of phase two of the strategy to, to support by supporting in, 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 uh, effective implementation. And that should start, had to start fast before 
countries disengage. They had to be kept engaged. Next slide, please. Yes, and just for your information, you have four minutes left. Are we oh, God. announce this? Okay. Uh, I will four minutes left. Yes. I'll go first. Until 30. Okay. The okay, the first effort for a partnership at COP uh, was done at, at COP uh, to seek concerted efforts for implementing phase two to achieve target 11, highly promoted a number of flyers distributed uh, at that COP and uh, a whole day discussion of the Rio Convention pavilion. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> I'll, zoom, I'll go fast. Uh, so the second, once the support was sought, uh, the second phase started. The goal, as I said, is to speed up impl Im implementation. Um, and the main support to, to countries was work through sub-regional coordination agencies and their regional implementation support network. We we had uh, small scale funding agreements with different agencies to work with the countries uh, of their sub region and provide um, focused cap capacity development to them. And uh, then the information had to be reported to COP. And then uh, we went into formal launch of an informal global partnership. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, this COP, the most important is that COP adopted the definition and criteria of selection of other effective area-based conservation measures, which countries were uh, stuck with. They needed the definition and also criteria of identification. And um, at the pavilion, again, um, we we sought really the support of parties. Uh, next slide, please. That's the global partnership um, formally launched. Then in 2019, we had to take a stock taking and, coordin uh, and coordination and development of a monitoring plan meet meeting again. It was again to further support coordination agencies and push countries uh, to uh, finalize at least projects which are in the pi pi pipeline uh, and report as soon as possible to UNIT WCMC because that will be the global platform. We also had a thematic workshop on area-based conservation to inform the open-ended working group on the post 2020, uh, to inform them about what worked, what didn't work, and what was expected in the post 2020 period. A global report and updated uh, the updated 196 uh, country dossiers were also launched and then preparation for COP started. Next slide, please. This is the final result. We clearly see, we have seen what happened to 2010, um, then slight slowdown, and, and, and then it started picking up in 2015. And in this graph, we also see a slight slowdown in reporting um, during the, 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 the COVID period. So terrestrial uh, protected areas was achieved the target 16.98. Currently, it's at 1719. Uh, marine, it's below the target. Uh, the target was 10%. This is because um, 
protection within national jurisdiction has already reached nearly 19%, 9% over the target. But the problem is the areas beyond national uh, beyond national jurisdictions, which has coverage on, of only 1.44%. And that area covers um, uh, sixty-one percent of the global global ocean. The BBA and J mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'm really sorry, Adi, but we are just coming to the end of the presentation, and if we want to keep just a few minutes for the Q&A, yeah, that's... could you please, I don't know, conclude your presentation shortly in a few words, because the like the yeah. end is still so much important. Okay, uh, so that it's the success of Target 11, which created the momentum and uh, encouraged parties to, to adopt uh, Target 3 of the Kunming Montreal uh, Biodiversity Framework. It's 30 by 30, not 30 by 3. I'm sorry about that in the first line. And there are a lot of opportunities to achieve this target, the 30 by 30 but there will be need for more emphasis on the qualitative element uh, of the target in the future. Uh, achieving this target is really crucial to uh, generate multiple benefits. Next slide and I, I, I'm done. So multiple benefits to SDGs contribution to uh, Paris Agreement uh, and, in general, um, well-being of society. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. And I hope together we'll build a partnership for Target 3 of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. We are grateful to Jeff and our numerous partners and donors who helped us through all this process, all these years. I, I mentioned only just very few. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so sorry. much, Edgy. And I'm so sorry for this time constraints. It's good. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. And does anyone have any question on Edgy's presentation? on the process for conservation or oh, we have you have end clappings <laughs> but if you have any question you can either type it in the chat and i can read it for you or you can um raise your hand on zoom uh yes leonardo please take the floor hi thank you very much for giving me the the word i just wonder if she could explain a little bit better what is the 30 by 30 target so because she didn't have the time to do that during the presentation okay can we go a little bit back to the target the previous previous slide please the previous one yeah that one okay the 30 by 30 is that uh no don't go far the the next one yeah this one Okay, the 30 by 30 refers to target three has become to be, it's ambitious and it became to be known at the 30 by 30 because the conference of the parties decided that uh, we need to ensure and enable that by 2030, at least 30% 30 of terrestrial and inland waters and of marine and coastal areas need to be protected. But there are criteria, especially areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services are protected, equitably governed, effectively managed, and whatnot. All these other the quantitative the quantitative targets are 30% protection of terrestrial areas and inland water. 30% protection of uh, marine and coastal areas. That's the quantitative part. And the rest of 
the language in the target referred to various uh, qualitative elements. They have to be effectively managed, well connected. They have to recognize indigenous and traditional territories. They have to respect the rights of indigenous people and whatnot. It, it gives the, the details. Compared to Aichi Biodiversity Target 11, ta uh, Aichi Biodiversity Target 11 had 17% uh, coverage requirement for target 11 and 10% for ocean. But now we have issues with the with the marine areas. It's only 8.26% and that is mainly because of the high sea. We are expecting more coverage of the global ocean. So instead of 10%, we expect coverage of 30% in the few in 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 the, by 20 by 2030 terrestrial was 17 now it's 30 percent coverage that is required is it achieve achievable yes especially when we consider when we start recognizing um and reporting on oecms pps and um also indigenously conserved uh, areas. It may require a little bit more mainstreaming for probably for coverage of the high sea and that agenda is being appropriately taken care of uh, international, internationally. And we hope that there will be also coverage of that area, the high sea up to 30%. But in the coming years, we need to focus more on the quality of uh, the qualitative elements of um, protection for us to be able to benefit really uh, from the areas. Thank you. Did I answer your question, Leonardo? Thank yes, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can now hear Jean Rod Rodriguez. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I was also having a question regarding target three um, and specifically I'm curious of uh, what kind of uh, guidelines are the um, secretary like, given on the implementation of target three when it comes to recognizing indigenous and traditional territories, apart from the language on rights-based conservation that it's uh, mainstream throughout the, the GBF. Uh, and if you could mention something on uh, why uh, recognizing indig uh, why indigenous and tra traditional territories are not uh, uh, clearly uh, recognizes a third way of achieving the 30 by 30 goal. Thank you. The indigenous, uh, the protection of traditional and in indigenous territories is covered in, in, in the, in the tar target. Actually, this is the, the, the first time we had information in the POPA about this, but compared to target 11, this is the first time where detailed information is provided regarding the recognition and respect, um, uh, recognition of um, indigenous and traditional territories and respect of um, the rights of indigenous people because they have large areas in their hand. Uh, most of uh, their governance and management is sustainable. And it's, it will be important to work 
wisdom, their full participation in this is needed. There are many evidence that, that show that with, without the participation of indigenous people and local communities in decision-making without free prior informed consent from them, trying to protect is, is, is not as beneficial as working with them. We, we have already seen that many times. So that's one of the reasons we have started strategic planning meetings within the CBD. We have been involved in that during the last months. And we are working closely with the people and biodiversity team uh, to work on this. The people and biodiversity team focus on IPLC issues, Article 8J and whatnot. So at this this time, we will not only consider the various important articles and provision um, of, of Article 8J, uh, but also closely collaborate to do the work with the people in biodiversity team, because this is uh, very important. They occupy large area around the world. Their traditional knowledge has to be respected we can only benefit by working with them um, and uh, by seeking their full participation. We are inviting them more and more than before in our meetings regarding protected area issues as well. Did I answer your question? I did not answer. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I'm afraid we now need to go back to the main room for the rest of the program. Florian, I, I've seen that you had your hand raised. Maybe it's a question you can type in the chat and maybe Eji can have a look at it during the the rest of the of the webinar so that we can have a response to your question. Yes, or you okay. can send it to us and we can send it to Eji afterwards to make sure you have a reply. But we are very time constrained and are already over timing, so we really need to go back to the main room. Yes, I'm sure. really sorry. Sure, no worries. Follow your time schedule, no problem. I'm sorry on this slide, first, second line, it's 30 by 30, not 30 yeah. by 3. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> two letters have disappeared. Thank you. Thank you. So we will soon go back to the main room automatically. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can you all see my screen? Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, is that in full screen or not? Okay. Full screen. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us for the breakout room. So I will now give the floor to Isabel Martinez Gonzalez, sorry. Uh, and um, she's working uh, in the SCBD, so the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and will present you ways to get involved as a scientist in uh, the issues at stake regarding biodiversity and health within the convention. So please, the floor is yours, uh, Isabel, and many thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Are you going to ch share the presentation, Charlotte, or do I do it? Uh, I will share it, and if you okay, see please. it, you can just tell me when, yeah, when I need to move on to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is that working? Uh, no, I'm not seeing it. Is anyone else seeing it? No, 
I can see it now. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, good morning, or well, good morning for me, good afternoon for you. My name is Isabel Gonzalez. So, I work at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity and I support the programs of invasive alien species, taxonomy, and health. So, I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar for inviting us to participate, and in particular, Biodiversa Plus and the European Union. So, today I would be talking to you about the work of the Convention regarding biodiversity and health. Can you put the next one, please? So, I know you've already been given a lot of context on the CBD, but I would also like to start by giving a bit of context on the work we do. Uh, so the Convention on Biological Diversity is an international legally binding treaty that currently has 196 signatory countries or parties, and it has three main objectives, as you know from previous uh, presentations, so conservation of biological diversity, sustainable use of biodiversity and its components, and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits uh, rising from the utilization of genetic resources. So all our work operates under those objectives. So the Conference of the Parties is the Convention's main governing body. And because the Convention is a framework treaty, many of its provisions require further elaboration in order to provide a clear set of norms to guide states and stakeholders in their management of biodiversity. This set of norms is de are developed through decisions made by COP, and they're called COP decisions. Under normal circumstances, the Conference of the Parties meets every two years. Sometimes, extraordinary par uh, extraordinarily, parties can convene if needed and agreed. So we also have subsidiary bodies. So those are permanent bodies usually established by the government body of a, um, the international agreement, and they assist with the negotiations decided by COP. So, and the COP also is, can establish other ad hoc bodies, such as, for example, working groups, expert groups, or committees, if the parties decide it is necessary. Also, the COP decides how often this body will meet. In general, much of the work of the subsidiary bodies takes place during intersessional periods and is considering at, at the, considered at the following COP. So currently, the COP has established two permanent bodies, which is the SUBSTA, the Subsidiary Body on Scientific, Technical and Technological Advice, uh, and whose function include providing assessments on the status of biological diversity, providing assessments on the type of measures taken in accordance with the provision of the convention, uh, responding to questions that the COP may put the body, anything. And it usually meets once a year. And there's also the SBI, which is a subs subsidiary body of implement on implementation. And its four functions and core areas of work are review the progress of implementation of the convention, uh, strategic actions to en enhance this implementation, strengthen means of implementation and operation of the convention and the protocol. And the Bureau of the Conference of the Parties also serves as a Bureau of the sub uh, SBI. So sometimes parties may wish to create working groups to discuss issues they consider a priority in their negotiation process. So these working groups are more temporary uh, and they serve very specific purposes. So several working groups have been created across the CBD uh, timeline, but currently we have the ad hoc working group on Article HJ, which indigenous um, uh, groups. And during COP14, which was the COP previous to, to the last one, parties established a creation of a dedicated working group to carry out work and preparation for the what is known now as the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This is, this is called the open-ended working group. The next one, please. So uh, we have the text of the convention and its guidance is made concrete in these programs of work. So currently uh, we have several uh, thematic work programs. There, as you can see, they're mainly focused on different ecosystems. So agriculture, dry and subhuman land, forest biodiversity, inland waters, island biodiversity, marine and coastal biodiversity, and mountain biodiversity. So these programs have evolved greatly during the time of the COP, of the convention, and um, the COP has explicitly directed that the consideration of certain cross-cutting issues should be integrated into the thematic work programs. So here's an example of some of the cross-cutting issues uh, we work on. So it's not an exhaustive list, but health and biodiversity uh, is one of the cross-cutting issues um, you know, that the, the convention is working on. 
Next one, please. So now uh, that we will have a clear idea of the work of the convention, I will talk a bit about the, uh, the work on biodiversity and health, cover the main elements and the main COP requests and the current work we're doing. So next one, please. So the main domain of our work on, on the biodiversity and health is on the linkages between these two areas. So, and the impacts, either positive or negative, that could occur from them. So there are many linkages between biodiversity and health, and, uh, but the easiest way to refer to them is acknowledging that biodiversity underpins nature's contribution to people and provides ecosystems, goods and services that are essential to human health and well-being. And the linkage is happening across scales, from interaction at the planetary level, for instance, all the biodiversity needed to maintain a healthy ecosystem that provides good services, to individual microbiota, so all the microorganisms needed to keep our bodies healthy and working. So to show the importance of these linkages, one can, can cite the examples of all the services that are provided by biodiversity, for example, food, livelihood, fuel, clean water, air, cultural enrichment, Biodiversity also contributes to uh, reduce or to regulate pests and diseases. And it also helps to mitigate the devastating impacts of climate change, natural disasters, and other drivers of biodiversity loss. The next one, please. So what is really the problem? So the CBD parties have recognized that biodiversity loss ecosystem degradation and negative health outcomes share many common drivers. So that gives a clear, mes clear message that by tackling these drivers, biodiversity and health, as well as their co-benefits could improve. So the COVID pandemic has exemplified the relationship by between biodiversity and infectious diseases and has raised awareness of these important connections. So if biodiversity continues to decline, its ability to provide essential goods and services for people's well-being and health will decline. So the message is very clear. There is no human health without biodiversity. The next one. So what needs to be done? Basically, and I say basically, but it's not easy, mainstreaming biodiversity and health interlinkages across sectors, including the health sector. This needs to be done at all levels, both at international level, linking and co cooperation between all the relevant organization, but also at regional co or country levels with national institutions. So we need to achieve a biodiversity inclusive one health transition that addresses the common drivers of biodiversity loss, disease risk and negative health outcomes. So as per the global uh, biodiversity framework, we need to make this everybody's business by promoting a whole of government and whole of society approach. The next one. So the key elements uh, of the biodiversity inclusive one health transition uh, entail that we need to reduce the risk, uh, disease risk by conserving and restoring ecosystems. We need to promote legal and safe use of wildlife, promote sustainable and safe agriculture, including crop and livestock and production and aquaculture, create healthy cities and landscape, and promote healthy diets as a component of sustainable consumption. So this is uh, this biodiversity inclusive one health transition come from the GBO5 publication that Sakile mentioned earlier, and it's presented as one of the transitions needed to live in harmony with nature. So the next one. So now our work and the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So now I have presented some of the background information on biodiversity and health in general, including on a reflection on why biodiversity and health linkages are important and what we can do to solve the problem. I would like to share to you what we do in this respect at the CBD. So first of all, uh, I remind you that CBD is a party-led process, and as such, parties give the Secretariat a mandate on areas and issues to work. So it's not a decision of the Secretariat on what to work. The mandate that's given to us as Secretariat often serves to bridge a gap between science and policy. So some decisions request the Secretariat to commission technical studies or work that could inform the liberation of the parties. Also, the work of the ad hoc technical expert groups plays an important role in providing the parties with technical advice and informed decision making. The next one. So I mentioned that the CBD uh, approach is done through the COP decisions. So in relation to health, 
uh, th these are some of the decisions that have been important for biodiversity and health. So yeah, as you can see, the first decisions were pretty generic. So recognizing, um, you know, that it was a cross-cutting issue, that it was, um, you know, important to um, to address the issue, etc. Uh, but then in the latest two cups, COP14 and COP15, uh, the parties have requested more focused, um, well, more focused tasks for the Secretariat to do. So one of them, for example, was adopting the guidance on integrating biodiversity con consideration into one health approaches. Uh, and the second, uh, on the last COP, which was in December, requested to work on a global action plan on biodiversity and health. The next one. So some of the work that has been done, and you can find that on our website, uh, most of the work, the CBD doesn't work in isolation. We work um, cooperation with different um, stakeholders. So these were done with the World Health Organization. So there's this publication on connecting global priorities, biodiversity and human health, a state of knowledge, guidance on, on how to integrate biodiversity consideration into one health approaches, uh, the biodiversity and infectious diseases. And there's also the fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook that I recommend that you read. So the next uh, slide, please. So now uh, that you know that um, there's a Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, sorry about the acronym, we usually call it the GBF. So the CBD has developed, developed at this new strategic framework that was adopted at COP15, which was last December. And it replaces the previous strategic plan for biodiversity 2011-2020. So the global biodiversity framework includes a mission to 2030, which is take urgent action to halt and reverse biodiversity loss, put nature on a path of recovery for the benefit of people and the planet. It also has four long-term term goals, milestones, 23 action-oriented targets, and a monetary, uh, monitoring framework and indicators to achieve a 2050 vision. So the GBF is relevant for the economic sectors due to the potential impacts of the business operations globally, ranging from regulatory requirements, incentives and subsidies, and resource mobilization, to name a few. The development of the GBF kicked off in early 2019. That was done organizing regional consultation workshops, thematic consultation workshops, online submissions and inputs, in addition to five open-ended working group meetings that were held between 2019 and 2022. So in all steps, non-state actors were invited to provide inputs and participate actively to ensure a comprehensive and inclusive process that provided a wealth of information made available to the parties and the co-shares of the process. It's important to highlight that the business sector in particular contributed in all instances, which was really welcomed. The next one. So how does the uh, GBF relate to biodiversity and health? Well, it aims to catalyze transformative action by governments and other actors to hold and reverse biodiversity loss, acknowledging the connection between biodiversity and health. It also encourages a one health approach among other holistic approaches to optimize health of people, animals, plants, and ecosystems. And it also recognizes the need for equitable access to tools and technology, including medicines, vaccines, and other health products related to biodiversity. It also highlights the urgent need to the decrease environmental degradation to reduce health risks. The next one. So while there's no specific target on health at the GBF, many of the GBF targets show biodiversity and health linkages. And they also reflect the importance of the healthy planet for healthy people. So for example, target one on spatial, spatial planet planning, land and sea use change. Target five who talks about the sustainable and safe use of wild species and that also will reduce the risk of pathogen spillover. Target seven, to reduce negative impacts from pesticides and high, highly hazardous chemical. Eleven, who calls for enhancing the nat nature contribution to people, including regulation of air, water, and diseases. And target 12, who focuses on um, urban, green, and blue spaces and its benefits. The next one, please. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, about a couple of ongoing activities that we're doing at the CBD currently. Next one, please. So the draft global action plan on health. So as I mentioned, we work through the decisions at the COP 
uh, gives us so uh, dur during the last COP, which was December uh, 2022, the COP requested the executive secretary to finalize the draft global action plan on biodiversity and health. So therefore, this document will be made available to the Substance COP in 2024. So the next conference of the parties for the CBD will be in 2024. Um, so the CBD has uh, a year and a half now to um, draft this global action plan. So the main objective of the action plan is catalyzing the mainstreaming of biodiversity and health linkages and also accelerate efforts towards a biodiversity inclusive one health transition. So its key elements are three strategic objectives, integration, mainstreaming and awareness. And they're also complemented by three supporting objectives, uh, which is surveillance, research, capacity building and funding. And for each of these objectives, there are action areas and elements for which a plan provides details. So this action plan can be a tool or will be a tool to support mainstreaming of biodiversity and health linkages. And everyone can use the action plan, either parties or stakeholders. And uh, just as a side note, there's a quadripartite for One Health made by the World Organization of Animal Health, WHOA, FAO, UNDP and World Health Organization, they have developed a joint plan of action. So this draft action, uh, action plan could complement uh, this uh, plan for actions. So basically, uh, how can you get involved? That was the, you know, the initial question. Uh, the CBD in, a, in our web page, we publish notifications and there's usually calls for experts, call for reviewing documents, you know, requesting information. So if you keep an eye on those uh, on that page, uh, you can contribute to the, for example, through your research to the discussion on the draft action plan. Something else you can do is also contact your focal, focal points of the CBD in your different countries and, uh, you know, give them the information needed to negotiate at the, you know, at during the substa or during the COP. So do you have any questions? Um, you know, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Isabel. It was super interesting and yeah, it's responses to the question about the involvement of scientists in CBD processes. So uh, does someone has a question? I see Sandra, so please, you have the floor. Yeah, sorry, um, this is just a comprehensive question. The last was a bit fast. So you made a recommendation what we can do on a national level, but I don't know. I oh, sorry. Was writing something down and then I didn't catch it. So Apologies. I tend to, to speak too fast. <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically, you can get involved with the work of the CBD through two main channels. So one is a notification. So the if you look uh, or you Google CBD notifications uh, and put biodiversity, because otherwise you get uh, something else. Uh, and Usually, uh, all the calls for experts, the calls for reviewing documents, for open forums, etc., the different mechanisms that the CBD has to review or to, um, you know, get input from experts will be published there. These notifications are also sent to focal points. So each uh, party or each country has a focal point uh, for the CBD. It's usually the Ministry of Environment in most cases but it varies uh, in the different countries. So uh, these notifications go to the focal points and the focal points are supposed to spread them the, uh, in their countries and, and get the information. Uh, so, but if you're aware of this process, you can you know, keep an eye on what's being published uh, notification wise. Also, you can also directly contact your, your focal point for the CBD and ask how you could contribute to the discussions. Usually before the meetings, about three months before the meetings, all the, um, uh, the documents that will be discussed during a meeting, a substa meeting or a COP meeting are sent to the parties and they do internal consultations of the, of the documents. So that's another way of participating and making sure your expertise is considered in the documents, especially the substa documents were very technical ones. Um, that's a, the way to do it. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Uh, does someone has a question? Otherwise, I would raise one. 
So would you say scientists uh, in the past raised awareness and led um, to, for example, the draft global action plan, which is um, now being drafted within the CBD? So did scientists play the role in raising awareness about the linkages between health and biodiversity? Of course, and I think uh, scientists play a role in all the convention. I mean, this is a scientific based convention. It's uh, the decision are science based. So it's not only for health, but I think for all the issues that the convention is dealing with, the contribution of scientists is critical. We couldn't work without scientists. So please keep doing it. Please, Rob, go ahead. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, the question regarding uh, this opportunity to review. Uh, if I understood you correctly, then this draft global action plan uh, will be among the um, the documents uh, uh, for Substa 24. And if I if my information is correct, that will be uh, this autumn in, in October. And uh, this, uh, my question now is, uh, will this document be open for review? And if so, um, uh, is there any indication where our experts uh, or the people in this room could uh, uh, look and when could people uh, be aware of this opportunity to review? Because I think it is obviously uh, a possibility to just Google and see whether there's a notification out, but it would be helpful if people are aware now already, if there's an opportunity to review uh, a document coming up. So that's my question. Thanks for that. Thank you. Yes, so as far as I'm aware, this draft global action plan will be reviewed in the next subset, not this one. So this is subset 25, which will be in October. And I think uh, the global action plan will be reviewed uh, at the next subset, which will be subset 26 in 2024. So one thing you can do so you don't keep, um, you know, checking the website is you can subscribe, you, you put an email and you get all the notifications that are coming out. And you can probably use, um, you know, keywords or something, so you don't get all the notifications because it's really a lot of notifications. Uh, and as I said, so the notification comes out usually three three months before a meeting, saying this document is up for review. And the documents, um, what the CBD does, they open a, a website for the, the meeting. So in this case, it will be Subsa 26, and the documents will be there for download for uh, reading and for uh, reviewing. But the uh, comments need to go through the CBD focal point of your country. So you need to identify who's your focal point and send the information through them. So it's not open to anyone can, you know, send the, the comments to the CBD, but it is open to anyone can send the, the, the comments to their focal point and then the focal point catalyzes that into the CBD. I'm not sure if that helped. Uh, yes. I do have a question uh, about, well, the, this one health concept here. So, uh, so the one health concept is originally only focused on agriculture, uh, animal health and, and human health. So it's nothing about biodiversity. Now it goes towards biodiversity. It goes a little bit towards climate change, but it's like in the past, where on the COP on climate change, nothing about biodiversity was discussed and vice versa. Uh, now there's this concept of planetary health. So like in, in the One Health concept, for instance, ecologists are normally excluded. So it's medical doctors and veterinary doctors and agriculture who is saying, well, we know how to uh, talk about One Health and you can give us a little bit of input. Uh, so it's definitely not a holistic uh, uh, approach at all, even if one health, the, the word uh, may uh, may create this uh, perception. Now there is the new term planetary health, which is again hijacked by medical doctors. Uh, and so when they talk about planetary health, 
they don't mean ecology, they don't mean biodiversity again. So uh, I, I think it needs an, an open political discussion about these terms and how to use these terms because they are simply abused. And then there is confusion and then there is no meaningful outcome because well, uh, there, there is a certain trend uh, of, of topics and then disciplines just tend to take over and exclude other disciplines and pretend that they would be interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary at all. So I, I think this is, is really a, a problem that needs to be seen here. I agree with you and I think you have summarized very well the issue that we have and the challenge that we have into uh, you know really creating a holistic one health approach. So you've basically, how, how we say in Mexico, you hit the nail on the head. So yes, so hopefully you can contribute to, with this discussion um, with the global action plan. And I think it's also very important to include glossaries, always include glossaries into documents because yes, you agree. I mean, I work ma mainly with invasive alien species and there's also the problem of what is an alien species, what's an exotic naturalized, pest, disease, etc. So, so yes, thank you very much. Yeah, maybe one, one additional comment, because this is also about capacity building. Uh, so in, in our university in Bayreuth, Germany, we have established now two new master programs. One is an international master program on uh, environment, climate change and health. Uh, that's for international students and it's free, uh, no tuition fees and so on. Uh, and the other one is a postgraduate uh, master program, and both of them, are, and, and so that is for people that already work in clinics, for instance, or work in health uh, administration, uh, to train them in these topics, because I think this is really the main aim. So we will not influence policymakers, maybe directly, but we may influence the next generation. And uh, that is why I think capacity building is really the key and uh, this is what we need. We, we need a network of capacity building and a network of next generation young scientists who will have another perception because they will be trained already in a broad spectrum of disciplines and backgrounds and don't understand themselves as entomologists or medical doctors or climatologists anymore, but rather as global ecologists. Thank you, yes. And I also would like to encourage Nadia mentioning about uh, capacity building. At the moment, we're discussing uh, how to implement this global biodiversity framework. So there's a lot of room uh, at the moment to discuss what would the decision makers need from the scientific uh, community to be able to take the proper or the right decisions. So yes, I think it's fundamental to uh, to help the newer generation to come in, but we also need to find strategies to help decision makers now. So, as I mentioned, there were several uh, targets uh, that are not, you know, that touch on health. So maybe you could contribute to that as well, and you know, basically digest the information for the decision maker saying you need to do this, or I don't know. That's you know a bit of an idea. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a, an additional question about early career researchers. Do you have specific programs or um, within the CBD to better integrate uh, them into your uh, decision making process? Like, um, are you trying to? Um, gather the inputs, uh, scientific inputs, because, for example, within Biodiversity Plus, we have some early career researchers, uh, post-PhD uh, students, so yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, we work with uh, COP decisions. So sometimes, yes, the COP decision requests us to gather so horizon scannings, for example or to form um, ad hoc expert groups on certain issues. So that's a way of getting the, the information. We recently closed a, a horizon scanning on invasive alien species and diseases and pathogens, for example. 
uh, so people could you could send us the information there. But uh, you can also send it like that. Even if there's not not a call, you can also send it to the secretariat who would give it to the officer in charge, and that will be taken care of uh, or taken into account when the you know the we are reviewing the documents and we're writing the documents. Maybe I can also make a short uh, report about our own um, experience since almost 20 years. So we have registered our study program. Uh, that's another one. It's called Global Change Ecology. And that is registered in the United Nations as an own observer organization. And this opportunity should be taken by other universities as well. So our, universe, our students can participate in the COP on biodiversity, they can participate in IPBS regularly every year, and also in the COP on, on uh, biodiversity and, and, and climate change. And uh, we can support them with traveling money to these uh, meetings. And of course, it's always frustrating for the students when they come back because they go there with high expectations. And as observers, they can just observe, in most cases, the failure of the negotiations. But then, well, many of them would say, well, I, I will do a better job for my country in the future. Uh, so again, this is not a short term solution, but involving students as, as uh, observer or organizations into these international um, meetings is, I think, a very important strategy uh, also to make, uh, uh, yeah, them, give them less illusions about what, what can be achieved, but also encourage them to do a better job. Thank you. Um, does someone has a final question within the audience? Um, otherwise, um, I would be curious to know about the balance uh, between disciplines um, fitting in the global uh, action plan. Um, did you receive out inputs from natural scientists, ecologists, uh, veterinary uh, sciences, etc., or also from social sciences? So what was the balance of uh, scientific inputs received to draft such a global action plan? If you know uh, we, it, uh, no, we will receive them. We hope to receive them. So this was a, a document that was produced um, for Substat Twenty Four, and at Substat Twenty Four, they, uh, you know, they made a recommendation to COP that COP accepted that the plan needed further consideration and uh, in-depth review. Remember, we had the pandemic in the middle of it, so that sort of uh, skewed a bit the periodicity of the meetings. And it was complicated. Some of the uh, meetings were online and the parties didn't feel they have had enough time to review it, to review the, the documents because they, they all prefer to review it live and not uh, online. So that's why this document was bumped into the, the next uh, COP. So we hope to, re to receive comments from all those disciplines. I think it's very, very important that everyone has a say in this so yes please if you can spread the word and get your scientists involved in this revision all the disciplines will be welcome thank you thank you very much rob please thank you um yes um you mentioned uh, the uh, uh, the route uh, via the national focal points to uh, well to have the input uh, uh, transferred into the uh, the uh, discussions at the subsidiary uh, body of uh, scientific and, and technical advice. And I was wondering whether the, uh, the people uh, here in, in in this room. Uh, uh, are able or would be able to find their way to the respective national focal points. So it's a, a, a question uh, uh, perhaps to, to some of the participants, uh, whether or not uh, you would be able to, to find your national, uh, the relevant national focal point. 
and perhaps also it can be helpful in general to indicate where uh, the information of on national focal points uh, could be found on the uh, CBD website. Thank you. Okay, so the thank you. The focal points are usually. Um, I'm not sure actually. I'm not going to lie. Where on the CBD website these are found because the names change. It's usually, as I said, is the Ministries of Environment, and also the European Union has a focal point as European Union, besides uh, each country. Uh, I can send the information to Charlotte. I can find out and send information to Charlotte. So, oh, Sandra, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yes. And Alejandra? Hi, um, Anna. So, um, I think, so I, I'm a natural uh, science researcher. We're working with bees within one of the projects from Biodiversa and pollinators in general, so ecosystem services. Um, I have seen some of the notifications, but like, I never feel like perhaps I'm in the right moment to send data or to send the results when they are still not published and things that things like that. And I was wondering more if there would be from your side, from your team side, I mean, um, some search for specific reviewers or experts like the professor where I work in the chair, or like if there would be, if you do that to ensure that you have a balance from the scientists in your um, draft uh, action plan, even if they don't come to you by themselves. I, I just say that because I find so little time. I mean, our project is already an extension time due to COVID, so it will end and I will go jump into a new project. And of course, I will work a bit longer to get the publications done. And I am already involved in the IUCN as well. And as you know, we all have a lot of things. If, I think it would be more efficient, at least in my case, and maybe my colleagues sort of similar, if I would get contacted, like we need an expert on pollinators for this part of this document. Do you have like an hour, two hours to to review this and make your comments? Something like that. If is is that initiative from your side to ensure that pollinator scientists are also there as well as others, or is this too complex for you guys as well? Like, uh, yes and no. So as I as I mentioned, sometimes COP decisions request the secretary to convene a group of experts and then we do a call for experts we also look i mean uh during our daily work for publications and the latest latest publications on the different issues to try to incorporate them in the in the documents but uh the call for experts and the direct involvement of experts is done through uh notification which are fed by the cop decisions uh, so there Oh, we need to leave the breakout yeah, room. Thank you for the answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank and you very much. If you much. have further questions, you can also put them in the chat in the general room, in the main room. I can start to present the next session. So that will be on getting involved in the CBD processes as a scientist. So Didier Babin, who is researcher at CIRAD France and scientific advisor at the post-2020 biodiversity framework um, EU support project that you maybe heard about. Um, he could not join us today, so we are going to display the recorded video of his intervention. And so as he will uh, present himself in the beginning of the video, I will not say more and I will share the video. And can you all see my screen? Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Didier Babin. I'm a researcher with uh, CIRAD France. I've been a national focal point of the substar of the CBD during uh, around my eight years and uh, international expert on mission at the Secretary of CBD as a senior program officer on poverty eradication, development, and biodiversity during uh, five years. I've also been involved on the process for the creation of IPBES as uh, executive secretary of IMOSEP process. And actually, I'm a senior strategic scientific advisor of the post-2020 biodiversity framework EU support and a scientific member of the advisory board of Biodiversa Plus. 
Personally, I have always considered that science and knowledge must be mobilized to inform decision-making processes, especially when they are complex. The scientist is not there to take the decision. He just participates in the process. It is something very frustrating when you think that the decision does not take into account your point of view. To see that the decision taken is probably not good or risks uh, having harmful consequences for biodiversity. But this is the rule. After a few years of experience in science policy interface, I think that scientific information is useful for politics when it justifies a reinforced uh, orientation, position, or objective already widely chosen or established, or at least acceptable by decision makers. It is very rare that science uh, do radically change a political decision. But little by little, science and knowledge influence the way of seeing or thinking, and they end up uh, modifying some political or economic or social orientations. This is why we must develop the conditions to promote those interfaces and not hesitate to, to invest in these transformations of mentalities or thinking, including with politicians and diplomats. The Convention on Biological Diversity has always mobilized science and knowledge to try to guide more virtuous policies or practices for biodiversity via guidelines, documents, approach like the ecosystem approach, working groups, and also via the thematic program of work of the CBD. Originally, this, the substar of the CBD was to be the body for this purpose, but as in other negotiating arenas, such a type of intergovernmental body is used mainly to prepare policy decisions that are too wiki based on science. This is largely why the IPBES and other science policy interfaces were established. It's probably not yet powerful enough, but it's a big progress to help changing views based on some scientific consensus. I don't think that the consortium of scientific partners is really an efficient tool, but it can facilitate some collaboration with the CD. During long time, ecological and biological sciences were the most mobilized sciences. I think that social sciences and economics, political science need to be also mobilized, especially when we focus on transformative changes. If we have in mind the actual discussion on monitoring the global biodiversity framework implementation, science is also useful to evaluate the capacity of indicators to measure real progress to face goals and targets. Personally, I think that the most crucial role of scientists is now to facilitate establishment of performant NBSAPs and to facilitate and monitor their implementation at national or more local level. One can, of course, also try to engage in official works or working groups of the CBD process defined by the COP. But most of the time, places are very few and everyone must be proposed by his or her country national focal point. It is also possible to contribute to IPBES reports or evaluation, but I think that scientists must be involved in the implementation aspects in relation with key stakeholders as subnational and local governments, businesses, NGOs, media, and others. All of them contribute to change our relationship to biodiversity. And of course, research program needs to illuminate decision-making processes, especially on sustainable use of biodiversity beyond conservation aspect. There is a need to develop more research on what I call strong sustainability sciences with pluridisciplinary pathway, including biology, physical sciences, but also economic and social sciences. IPBES report asks to transform the society and the economic model. 
science and knowledge must contribute to design a more equitable, carbon neutral and natural positive world. I'm not at all informed about the uh, COARA reform, but I know that there is no concrete benefits in terms of academic career for scientists to connect with policy. I hope that it can change. So I hope you didn't have any issue with hearing the debate about the video is, and actually to build on the video, I will now invite Professor um, Raymond from the University of Helsinki in Finland, and who is also project coordinator of the now over Envision research project, which is part of another call of Biodiversa 3, which is called Biodivsen. Um, so he will present us his experience in the science policy interface, outlining the benefits, the challenges that he identified, and also he will maybe provide key advices for academics interested in, in getting involved in such processes. So the time that you connect, and I can see you here. Thank you yes. so much for joining, and I will share um, the slides now. Thanks very much, Chloe. And thanks to everyone uh, for this great session. Yes, so as Chloe mentioned, my name is Professor Christopher Raymond. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, my experiences in the Envision project, but also some uh, wider science policy interface initiatives, which complement and enhance what I've been doing on Envision. Um, just want to recognize my colleagues who are also involved in the Envision project, who are listed underneath my name here. So this is a collaborative effort. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so it, uh, I was asking a bit of a background to my work as, at the Science Policy Interface. Um, it started many years ago, back in 2006, uh, at a state government level, uh, when I was part of the DWLBC, or Department of Water, Land and Biodiversity Conservation, and I was heavily involved in de developing capacity, uh, community capacity assessment tools for natural resource management planning in South Australia. Um, but in 2016, 20 to 2018, no, 2016, 2017, I was part of this eclipse uh, mechanism and developed the first uh, co-benefit assessment framework for nature-based solutions, which uh, was a volunteer commitment for six months, but um, led to quite a bit of impact at the European level in terms of informing uh, how we assess, can assess, the co-benefits of nature-based solutions, but equally further developing a definition of nature-based solutions, which has since been further developed for the United Nations. And more recently, through my role as coordinating lead author of the best values assessment, chapter two, which is focusing on the conceptual basis of values. Um, next slide, please. Um, but here I'm going to focus mainly on Envision. So Envision uh, uh, was all about how we engage diverse stakeholders in a more in inclusive approach to the conservation of protected areas. We had uh, a very, at uh, our roots, we were, had a both an inter-site knowledge alliance, which was stakeholders working collaboratively across our sites, as well as within site knowledge alliances or local knowledge alliances. Um, to, collectively worked further to scientifically developing this concept of inclusive conservation. And we had different arms to our project. We had an arm around uh, considering multiple visions for protected area management, assessing the consequences of those visions, social learning and collectively defining new visions, assessing uncertainty and building resilience, acknowledging parallelations and rethinking governance. But all of this informing biodiversity and protected area management policy in partnership with uh, IUCN. Um, next click, please. And so we did this in a range of case areas, Denali National Park in the United States, Vesterhag in Sweden, Sierra de Gomala area in Spain, and Cromorra in the Netherlands. And importantly, we applied a range of methods, both uh, social science methods and natural science methods. It was a very interdisciplinary project. Next slide, please. Um, I suppose what, what we had a number of papers, scientific papers in this project, but uh, we we also emphasise these what we call them synthesis papers, and this is one example on the left here. Um, we were very much working across work packages to inform uh, scientific debates, and this in this case it was looking at tensions and prospects associated with inclusive conservation on the post twenty twenty agenda. 
And so we we're very clear early on to make sure that we were linking our work to timely academic and policy debates at that time. Next slide, please. And um, I think what we recognise for our work when we by drawing upon the our interdisciplinary methods is that our partnerships are key if we're wanting to support more inclusive conservation of protected areas. We need to recognise opportunities to reframe problems across knowledge systems, supporting reflection, critical reflection about given tensions, supporting knowledge dialogues that enable within knowledge and across knowledge uh, exchange, um, acknowledging social learning that has occurred during the process, both within the research team and across our stakeholders, and recognising that conflicts and, and, and set views around um, protected area management exist, which may not always be based on science. And so through the pro our project, we continuously re-invited uh, uh, re repositioning of previous dichotomies and also emphasising very clearly the need to co-create protected area management strategies. Next slide, please. Um, one of the, I think, key successes of Envision was that we worked very closely with IUCN, uh, as well as a science communicator. We developed a, a range of uh, policy briefs, three policy briefs, in addition to eight fact sheets, several reports, which all had a coherent uh, theme. Uh, and, and, and presentation, and they were targeted at both the site level, at the study area level, but also across the EU and, and US levels. So we really tried to pitch our work to different stakeholder groups. In addition to that, we ensured that our results and key findings were embedded in Panorama Solutions, which is a, a, a web platform supported by IUCN, but uh, it's where protected area managers globally can highlight key solutions for protected area management. So that way science can inform the management discussion around uh, protected areas. Next slide, please. Um, I was asked to comment on the role played by IUCN. Uh, IUCN had various roles. They organised the science policy webinars to and they advertised those through their global network, which increased, increased the reach of our project. They brokered partnerships with senior representatives of DG Environment and members of the European Parliament. We actually had members of the European Parliament part of our project discussions. Uh, they, they helped write policy briefs, which are targeted to timely policy challenges and events. And they also created opportunities for us to present at the IUCN World Congress and other events organised or attended by IUCN. Um, there are a range of examples here. I won't go through them today but uh, in detail, but they include things like the European Parliament intergroup presentations uh, and webinars involving uh, a range of stakeholders on inclusive conservation of protected areas, balance, balancing stakeholder visions. Next slide, please. So what are some of the benefits of working at the science policy interface? I think there's real opportunity to influence policy and political events at an EU level. Um, yes, um, we were able to get inclusive conservation onto the European Parliament agenda, which was, I think, a key win for this project. I think uh, that only happened, though, not through the complementary work that IUCN did in lobbying for the scientific um, evidence that we presented within a, within their networks. Um, through working at the science policy interface, you also have great awareness of the barriers to and opportunities for science to inform the policy process. And I'll talk to some of those barriers in a minute. Uh, we, we develop new networks and relationships, particularly with people of whom you would not normally engage. This includes uh, policy makers at regional and national level, as well as the EU level. And indeed, in our case, because we had US involved, we also made networks at the um, National Park Service Washington office. Um, and in terms of impact, uh, we, we increased our impact by elevating the importance of biodiversity conservation, justice and wellbeing issues at, at both EU and global agendas. Next slide, please. Some of the challenges. Um, we need to be very responsive to events in the policy cycle. They work on a very different timeline to science, and that means we need to accept imperfect results and, and in order to respond to fast requests of policymakers. IUCN was asking us for rapid advice on certain topics to inform the post-2020 discussions, and we realised nothing. what we were presenting was not perfect, but 
uh, we, we gave it to them to be timely and so that it could have the greatest impact. Except that organisations may draw upon our results in ways that, but that you may not initially intend. Things can get sort of changed uh, through the policy process, also by the media, and you just have to accept that. Uh, and, 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 and that's, that's part of the, 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 the dissemination process. Um, you have to change the nature of communication from nuances of theory, concept, approach to elevator pitches on policy relevance. So key messages linked to policy. And you need to learn how to navigate conflicts, including different normative stances on what is right. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of critique, the policy crisis, the, the policy, policy crises that we have for biodiversity, climate, et cetera, demand scientists to become advocates informed by evidence. Advocacy often has it seemed to be a dirty word in, in science, but I, I greatly believe we can be advocates if we have the evidence to support our position. And so we have to change our views on advocacy, advocacy in order to have a seat at the table. We need to engage at the science policy. Engaging at the science policy interface takes more time in terms of additional reports, outputs, communications, and service. And a lot of us have, have lots of other things to do in academic work and, and in our universities. We have to find the time for this, and, and that can be challenging, but also rewarding. Um, scientists are serving different masters, um, meaning that we are serving the, the publication cycle and a need for uh, impacts at, in research, but also we need to have science and policy impact. Um, and somehow we have to work with these different masters. And I encourage my students to think about this in terms of a portfolio approach to our work. Next slide, please. So in my advice, be bold, engage with policymakers, even if you're only 80% certain about uh, or happy with your results. Be willing to listen to diverse views and be responsive to immediate requests. Uh, and in-kind commitments to science policy engagements can lead to high impacts. The challenge is to learn to when to say yes and when to say no. Um, a lot of people saying told me, was, no, don't accept the eclipse request a, a number of years ago, but I must say it was one of the most fulfilling and, and most impactful uh, events of my life. So, um, yeah, you, you have to be uh, open to saying yes, but equally having some intuition to and, and, and maybe courage to say no uh, at different times. Next slide. So thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge uh, Biodiversa and the Belmont Forum who, who supported the funding of Envision, as well as our national partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Raymond, for sharing your experience. I like really think it's it was an enlightening and presentation that gave um, key elements to the reality of engaging to the science policy interface, including the benefits you earn, um, such as with greater impact of your project, but also the challenges and critique that you identified. And so I don't know if this raised some questions uh, in the minds of all the participants that are here. Um, so if you have any questions, please um, don't hesitate to raise your hand again or um, type them on the chat and I can read them for you. We can we can have a few minutes for questions. Sorry for, for the timing of the workshop. We are going a bit over uh, five o'clock. But Please, if you have any questions, share with them. Share them. Yes, Leonardo. Okay, thank you very much once more for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. So I'm always curious uh, about how efficiently can the scientists influence the policy making, or in other words, to what extent those policies that are created are based on scientific evidences. Do we know about it or can we know about it? Yeah, I, I can try to answer that. Now, well, I, I think tracing how science and scientific evidence informs a policy decision is very difficult uh, because of all the different steps in between us giving advice and, and, the, and the final decision. Um, 
what we found for Envision, though, is that uh, through having IUCN as a partner, we got a lot of messages uh, relayed back to us around how things were being used or not used. Uh, and it is a very, um, yeah, it's like a braided stream of many things coming together uh, and ultimately informing a decision. It's not just uh, one project's uh, evidence. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a really difficult question to answer. And in fact, a lot of consultants out there today trying to find ways to measure impact of projects and, and they still don't have a, a, a brilliant answer to this question. But thank you. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions left? Before going to the next step and the conclusion. No, no other question. Okay, so to conclude this webinar and provide you further information on the next steps, I will hand, on, hand it over um, to Rainer um, from DLR in Germany. Um, so Rainer is responsible of coordinating international activities within Biodiversity Plus. And so Rainer, you have the floor for, for the concluding remarks. Thank you, Chloe. <clears throat> um, so uh, it's, it's an honor for me to conclude this uh, very interesting webinar here um, as being uh, Biodiversity Plus Vice Chair and uh, the Biodiversity Plus uh, um, leader of, of the work package on internationalization activities. So um, yes, next slide, please. Um, we, we learned a lot actually this afternoon about uh, lots of interesting and different um, terms uh, um, regarding international biodiversity policy. We learned a lot about uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, its processes, its uh, governance, uh, different bodies like the Secretariat, but also its subsidiary bodies uh, um, where science can uh, feed in about the conferences of parties. Um, we learned about the, the protocols like the Katrina Protocol or the Nagoya Protocol. Um, and um, of course, also about um, the strategic plan for biodiversity. It's uh, uh, from the IG target and now uh, the Conway Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and its golden targets. And of course, we learned a lot about um, the science policy interfaces. Uh, how can science uh, really um, yeah, um, feed into um, the CBD processes? Um, science policy interfaces like the IPIS, for example, and, and other bodies. And so um, maybe it's, it's a bit overwhelming. So next slide, please. Um, we uh, recorded, of course, this webinar and uh, we will upload this recording uh, in a few days uh, uh, on our Biodiversity Plus YouTube channel. And um, so uh, you can watch um, um, this webinar and its contents again, and uh, you may also share it to uh, your partners, project partners, colleagues, uh, other interested uh, people who could not join us today. So um, um, it's uh, an offer uh, we serve to you that uh, we will uh, inform about uh, all these, these interesting inputs from today. Um, further on, we will have a survey we will send to, to you by email um, and uh, we will ask you um, to fill in this by 7th July um, in order for us to get ideas um, how we can better meet your needs uh, uh, regarding international policy aspects like the CBD and uh, how we can um, maybe improve our own activities uh, on capacity building. Uh, for that, for example, do we need a second level um, webinar uh, on CBD or uh, um, uh, do you need uh, yes, information about other international fora and how to engage in that? And then finally, we will also um, prepare training materials. Um, we will prepare this by September this year. Um, 
and these uh, materials will um, yeah, further explore um, different aspects we were mentioning during this webinar today, for example, uh, different ways um, how scientists can get involved into the CBD, but um, yes, also um, yeah, in, in which processes actually you can um, feed in your expertise. And um, so um, we will also um, send this by email to you by then. Next slide, please. So what <clears throat> what is actually next? Um, so um, Butterweather Plus, as uh, the European Partnership, is actually pre uh, preparing at the moment a strategy uh, for um, its input into the implementation of the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, um, this will be presumably ready by uh, end of this year, so in the last quarter, uh, 2023. Um, we're also happy to inform you about that, and maybe it's uh, a bit, uh, yeah, um, um, also interesting uh, uh, um, how science can feed into um, the CBD too. Then um, we are uh, or have actually prepared a big mapping study of the international collaboration uh, between um, scientists of the European research area with other regions uh, of the world. And uh, we're just finalizing this study, which was prepared by colleagues from uh, Romania. Um, and uh, um, we'll um, publish this um, mapping study on our website soon, maybe in uh, July. And then um, also to mention um, um, our partner project, uh, uh, Co-op for CBD, which is uh, um, um, a project funded uh, under the uh, Horizon Europe uh, um, framework um, program. Um, which aims to enhance the coordination uh, within the European Union and um, in order to advance the implementation of the CBD and uh, harnessing um, the knowledge of experts uh, from the European research area, um, um, from, from experts. Um, um, this project uh, opened just opened a call for experts uh, in, in six different fields, uh, for example, plant conservation, but also biodiversity and climate change and other um, issues. And maybe you're also interested in that that and uh, um, we um, encourage you to apply or have a look at least uh, on, on this call where, which you also can see um, on our website biodiversity.eu. Okay so um, I don't know if there's uh, another slide but uh, um, thank you very much uh, for all your participation um, and um, of course, uh, um, to all the speakers and their excellent input today. Um, I'll also like to thank you very much um, um, for all our attendees uh, for uh, their valuable questions and remarks. And uh, of course, to our organizers here, to Chloe and uh, Charlotte from the French Ministry of the Environment and Mariam and colleagues from our operational team for organizing this great webinar. So I hand over to you, Chloe. Um, and uh, we will finalize this webinar for today. Thank you for attending a quarter past five. Uh, it was a bit longer as uh, we expected. <laughs> Chloe. Thank you very much. And I pass the floor to Charlotte. <laughs> yes, I will, I will be short. So thank you very much for joining us today. We hope it was useful and insightful uh, regarding the CBD science policy interface. And I would like to thank all the speakers and also the participants for their really interesting questions and your interest in, your interest in disseminating your research outcomes um, in science policy for us such as for example the cbd so thank you very much uh, especially chloe also and mariam and all the biodiversity plus organization team so thank you and see you hopefully later for another capacity building webinar or activity thank you thank you thank you thank bye you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. bye 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 bye